Welcome to Japan on Film Podcast. I'm your host, Perry Constantine, and welcoming a new guest today, fellow podcaster, and that is Robert Kelly. Robert, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Percy. Thanks for having me. And thanks for coming on. Um, so first, before we get started and talking about today's movie, I want you to take a few minutes and uh, tell the listeners and the viewers a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Robert. I do a show called Record All Monsters. It's about uh, giant monster movies, the history from King Kong to the present day, uh, with a special focus on Japanese giant monster movies. Uh, and I, I myself am interested in other kinds of movies, like what we're going to be talking about today. Um, but th those have a special place in my heart. Okay. And uh, what was it that got you interested in, in those movies in the first place? I, I really liked dinosaurs as a kid, and I remember I was about three years old, and we were at a Hollywood video uh, in my hometown, and I saw the VHS cover to Godzilla vs. Mechagodzilla, and I just, big dinosaur, big robot dinosaur, how's a three-year-old who loves dinosaurs not going to grab that tape? Um, and it just kind of became an obsession for me. <laughs> Uh, and it led down other pathways, finding other things, and yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, how long have you been doing uh, your show now? Record All Monsters, we're in our early part of our second season. Uh, so we started back in November of 2020. Okay, cool. So yeah, a little bit, um, roughly about the same time. I think I maybe started a little bit before you guys, but a uh, similar time frame thereabouts. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, so today we are talking about um, a movie that's probably not as well known as uh, the title character, and that is Sanjiro, which is a 1962 movie directed by Akira Kurosawa, and it's um, not so much a sequel, uh, but it is starring uh, the same character from Yojimbo, and once again, uh, Toshiro Mifune comes back to play uh, Sanjiro, and it was released like eight months after after the original. Um, but I think most people, when they think of Kurosawa and they think of Yojimbo, they mostly think of just that first movie. I don't, even though this one came with like a two pack with Yojimbo, I don't think mm -hmm. this is as well known uh, to most people as Yojimbo is. Yeah, I don't think so either. Uh... When I first came across this, I had just watched Yojimbo. Uh, it had been on the, on Hulu like maybe ten years ago. Yeah, back when they still had the Criterion Channel there. Yeah, and um, I loved it, and I saw there was a sequel or continuation or whatever it is, and I was just like, well, yeah, of course I'm going to watch that right away. And I actually like this one better. Okay, um, so yeah, that's interesting. You mentioned that uh, in our in our messages before we. Um, when we were trying to set this up, uh, which I thought was interesting because I, I definitely prefer Yojimbo to, to, to this one. I think Yojimbo might technically be a better film, mm -hmm. but uh, I find the story, it may be because I, I'm colored by having seen, like grown up with the Dollars movies and uh, Sergio Leone's uh, Fistful of Dollars is so close. So I kind of, and it's almost like, a, an unofficial it is an unofficial remake right yeah yeah they even got sued about it for it yes uh but so i was i think i was familiar with a lot of the story beats coming in and there were more surprises for me in sanjuro the first time i watched it that uh, makes that a lot of might, sense yeah that might be it and the other thing is the the characterization characterization of sanjuro is slightly different between mm. the two films in the uh in, in yojimbo he's very much like a stray dog coming in, coming into a situation. Whereas uh, in, in Sanjuro, he's like a sleepy bear that a situation is thrust up onto. Yeah. That, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. There is a, there's some differences in him. He's got, um, he's a bit more conflicted in Sanjuro too, compared to Yojimbo. I felt too, like there's a little bit more, questioning about uh his lifestyle and his way of life sometimes directly by him sometimes by other characters and you don't really get any of that uh it that kind of introspection really in yojimbo uh for me i think it's because 
Yojimbo was the first one. And I didn't actually have any of the uh, perception coloring based on the Fistful of Dollars because I didn't see that until after I'd seen Yojimbo. Mm -hmm. So that was, um, so for me, it was the opposite. Like, even though I love Fistful of Dollars, the first time I watched it, I was kind of like, like, yeah, wow, they really did rip this off. <laughs> I mean, like shot for shot, one of mm. my favorite Favorite things is the the shot at the beginning of Fistful of Dollars versus the shot at the beginning of Yojimbo, where in Fistful of Dollars, he's riding into town and a man on a donkey has a, a note mm -hmm. pinned to his chest. Whereas in Yojimbo, you get the wonderful, bizarre visual of the dog with the hand in its mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much... Uh much more subtle way of doing it, it kind of subtle way <laughs> different a different way of going about it it's a grizzlier way it's a yeah. grimmer way yeah um, um well also it, strangely enough though um even despite that yojimbo is still so much funnier than uh a fistful oh, of dollars yeah. that it's so, that, so funny yeah yeah and sanjuro is very funny too i found myself doing more than chuckling like i was laughing out loud at a few things especially uh near the end of the film where the the nine samurai are celebrating mm -hmm. prematurely and they remember they have to be quiet <laughs> and so they then the music starts i love the music in this i love uh master seto's scores mm -hmm. but the music starts they remember they need to be quiet the music stops <laughs> and then they start celebrating quietly and the music comes back at full force and then it fades out and they realize the enemy bodyguard they'd captured is celebrating with them <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it, jokes on jokes on jokes yeah and uh and one of the reasons i think for all the differences in this is because this was originally based on something completely different it was not originally intended to be uh to feature sanjuro uh it was um going to be an adaptation of uh a novel by shugoro yamamoto called uh, Hibi Heian was the, was the Japanese title. Um, mm -hmm. I can't recall what the English title was. I'd found it somewhere. I'm looking that up now. Um, and originally, Kurosawa was not going to direct this himself. He was actually going to have uh, someone else direct it, um, one, of his, uh, one of his assistant directors. Uh, mm -hmm. But because Yojimbo and that character became so popular, uh, Kurosawa had the script rewritten to make this uh, a Sanjiro movie, and he decided to direct it himself. Um, but yeah, and the English title of that novel was Peaceful Days. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why there's it. It's, I mean, you'd be forgiven kind of because one of the interesting things about the the Man with No Name trilogy is he's got a different name in each movie. Right. And, um, and Sanjiro does something like that too. He still has the the first name Sanjudo, but in the first one, it's uh, uh, Mul Mulberry Fields. Mulberry or... Fields, yeah, Kurobatake or something. I'm blanking exactly on the Japanese translation, but here it's Subaki. Yeah, Camellia Flower. Yeah, um, which is different from, and in both, but he has the same joke in both movies where Sanjudo means like, you know, around 30 year old person. And in both, he has the same joke where he's like, but I'm closer to 40 actually. <laughs> No, yes. Uh, this this movie is very special to me. I touched on the, the score earlier with uh, Masaru Seto. And because my, my background with Japanese film starts with the Godzilla movies, mm -hmm. I was very familiar with him. As a matter of fact, my first Godzilla movie, he scored oh, Godzilla okay. versus Mechagodzilla uh, from 1974. He scored that, and it's a wonderful, bizarre jazz score. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's there's a lot of similar similarities between this and his work in the Godzilla films. Okay. It's just the the overlap with uh with Kurosawa and the Godzilla movies, including uh, Ishiro Honda worked as his assistant director right. on his later films. And speaking of the, yeah, and speaking of the music, so I, I had to double check to make sure, but it was the same person who did, it was Sato who did the music for both this and Yojimbo. Yeah. I did think it was interesting because it's it's a very, until the end, when you get the, the familiar Yojimbo theme at the end. Yes. There. But up until that point, the music is very different 
from the music in Yojimbo. I thought that was pretty interesting. So I'd actually thought that it was the same, it was a different uh, composer this time around. Yeah, no, S Sato is very versatile. Uh, even in, like, I love, his, if you listen to his earliest scores for Toho, there's a, a whisper of what he's going to do eventually of how he's going to come to have those jazz influences on Japanese instruments and, but it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. He's, he's like doing an, uh, Akira Ifukube impression almost. And then I think his, cause like his seven samurai scores still unique. No, he didn't score that. I'm sorry. You think about Yojimbo? Score. Yes, Yojimbo. Sorry. Um, his Yojimbo score is when he is like in full flower of, okay, this is a Masuro Seto score. Mm -hmm. And I love Senjuro's score as well because it takes there are so many new motifs because we have these new characters and you don't hear the Yojimbo theme until right before the climax when he's marching to the gate on his own. Mm -hmm. And then the old theme comes on and you know, he goes from being that Papa Bear to these orphan cubs to being that mangy street dog mm -hmm. looking for a fight. And it's just a wonderful use of the music as expressing the character and letting the audience know what's going on. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't quite look at it in that. I didn't, I didn't interpret it in that way, but, uh, but that's a very interesting point. I just thought it was interesting how this one seems maybe a little bit more, I, I felt like this score was much more suited to this kind of story, whereas Yojimbo was much more this attempt at melding Eastern and Western genres together with, you mm -hmm. know, combining aspects of, uh, of the cowboy film and the detective film and mixing them in and putting them in, you know, you know, feudal Japan. Whereas this one is just more a straight up Japanese story. And the score kind of reflects that a little bit more. It's a little bit more closer to what you'd expect from a traditional samurai movie, as opposed to mm -hmm. Yojimbo, which is the score is, and I don't say this in a bad way, but it, it's kind of all over the place. And it's kind of like bouncing back and forth between yeah. those different genres. Yes. And that's, that's why I like Sato uh, or Sato. I can never Sato. remember which <laughs> Sato. That's why I like Sato because his, uh, he he is that versatile but you can tell mm -hmm. it's him if you listen to enough of him mm -hmm. i i have a i have bootlegs of his soundtracks and now the most of them are on spotify now so oh really okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah see that's it i'm always interested when people bring up the music in movies because for me not being a big music guy to begin with um unless it's something that really stands out uh, music isn't really something I pay much a, a whole lot of attention to. So um, mm -hmm. it's always cool to hear how people take away those different things from the music and from the score. Like Yojimbo's score is one that jumps out at me right away. Um, mm -hmm. The Godzilla theme as well, right? It's one that kind of jumps out at you. But for the most part, like this, the, the thing that stood out to me about this music is how it, how much it didn't stand out compared to Yojimbo. Right. And I think that's that's an ass. I think that's on purpose. Mm -hmm. Like I was saying, how the the score takes a different turn by bringing in the themes from Yojimbo at the end, mm -hmm. because so I I think it's he's an an outside. <laughs> I talk a lot on my show on Record All Monsters about how. Uh, there's a story archetype of the hero from outside, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how this is uh, in Godzilla's heel face turn, becoming the hero of his franchise instead of the longstanding threat. He is by necessity an outsider, but still a part of the structure of society. Mm -hmm. um, and Sanjuro fills a very similar role he is still part of the Japanese caste system as a ronin, but he has certain freedoms mm -hmm. that a, a samurai with a master would never have. But he, that still makes him something of an aberration, something, you know, kind of untoward in society. 
Yeah, like that... the like the the Chamberlain's wife says, you know, you're you're a naked sword. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's one of the aspects um, that I like in a lot of Japanese, a lot of these types of movies is that that idea of the outsider who's like just on the who's you know part of society but not completely a part of it at the same time, and. Um, uh, I'm not sure where you would say it would started, but Yojimbo was definitely one of the the early earliest mm -hmm. uses of it, I'd say. Um, and Godzilla is another good example as well, uh, especially as he as he goes on and becomes much more of a heroic character in the in the Showa films, um, yes. and even to an extent in the the American remakes, because he is still kind of that like you know part of society but outside it in a way right. like they find a way to make him kind of a heroic character while at the same time still acknowledging the fact that he's still a big monster that you know causes a lot of damage right and it it's uh it's it's uh like I, it goes back to like plato like mm -hmm. in the republic he he writes about how the external guardians of the city of the republic have to be part of the structure but they can't have relationships. They can't own property. They can't, their, their uh, priority needs to be the Republic, mm -hmm. but they can't really participate as citizens because they are guardians. Yeah. And uh, that's, you know, I think that's beautifully illustrated in a lot of Japanese films mm -hmm. and especially in this one, and especially because unlike in Yojimbo, where at the end it's kind of, well, best be moseying on, you know, and that cowboy rides off into the sunset. There's a real temptation here for him. Yeah, that's an interesting. That's that's an interesting point too. Is because when I when I, first time I watched this movie, and it had been years since I had seen it, so even when I was rewatching it again last night, I forgot about that scene when they find him at the end. Um, and I had always, and it the movie makes you feel like it's going to end with them just kind of like you know, looking for him and not being able to find him and just like mm -hmm. the fact. So it was interesting. They tacked on at the end, which although I think it is a good scene is they, when they find him with, with Hanbei and he kind of like, you know, and he, and he, and he reprimands them for like cheering for his victory and everything. Right. Yeah. And I just, I also forgot about that <laughs> when I, I watched it tonight and I just, I was like, didn't he have a fight with uh, Muroto at the end hey. of this? Wasn't it Hanbei he fought with at the end? Oh yeah, Hanbei is, is Muroto is his last name. That's right. Yeah, uh, like didn't he fight him like at the at the gate or something? Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh well. Then they go out and they find them, and the movie had the combat had been relatively bloodless. Yeah, that had kind of jumped out at me as well. That it was a it was a surprise at the end because even in and Kurosawa doesn't usually do that kind of combat in in his movies. Like if you look at Seven Samurai or Yojimbo, which were more violent, even still they didn't have the like the blood spurting effect. Yeah, which I was just thinking, man, that blood that guy's blood pressure must have been off the <laughs> charts to be spraying three feet out of his chest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, and it, it's kind of a a prediction of what we'll end up getting later in in, in some like the the sa the later samurai movies, like when you get to like Lady Snowblood and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, so I thought I thought it was an interesting um, kind of it was kind of like Kurosawa almost predicting where this genre would end up going in the next ten fifteen years. Because like I remember when I saw Thirteen Assassins when that came out. Oh yeah, and I mean the combat is choreographed largely the same. Very quick strokes and everything. A lot of under underhand sword use, mm -hmm. but every single sword strike, people are shooting blood out mm -hmm. like like geysers. Yeah, and uh, coming from some stuff like this, I was like, oh. <laughs> It was surprising, and I do wonder what was the what Kurosawa was thinking was when he when he did that when he directed that scene. If he just wanted it to to set it apart from the rest of the action, which had been relatively bloodless, just to draw more attention to to the violence of that scene. I, I, I'm really curious what he was thinking in that moment. I am too, but I think that would make sense what you just said because this this film sets them up 
as uh, parallels. Mm -hmm. So I think drawing drawing Muroto's death to be something, the most violent death, probably the saddest Mm -hmm. death in the film. Um, It's almost like a warning that you know, this is, Sanjuro is headed this way as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I did think it was, it's also interesting is that this is the first time in either movie, in either Yojimbo or Sanjuro, where Sanjuro feels some reticence to using violence, right? He, you can tell that he really doesn't want to go down this route. So I thought right. that well, was, and, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Well, ever since uh, the Chamberlain's wife told him mm-hmm. that you, you, you don't belong here. You need a, you know, you're you're useful in this moment, but you don't belong here. Mm-hmm. Again, the naked sword, good sword stain in the sheath, but you don't have one. Um, he's thinking about that the rest of the movie, and he brings up several times to the the nine other samurai. You know, like look what you made me do. Look what I had to do because you messed up, mm-hmm. and that gets that ex- that uh intensifies over the course of the film it goes from ah i wish i hadn't had to kill so many you know the first time it happens to at the end like admonishing them and mm-hmm. when when uh he releases them from capture and he has to kill like 27 people uh he slaps them mm-hmm. and he's yeah. like look and uh so yeah, you just see that working in his brain the whole rest of the movie. He's he's so relaxed throughout all of Yojimbo and through most of this movie. But after that, there's a level of discomfort that he, he doesn't really hide. And that's, or he tries to, but he can't really do it. And that's a great testament uh, to Toshiro Mifune's acting. Like, mm-hmm. of course, he's a great actor, but it's such a subtle thing. Well, also, too, something else about his acting style that I noticed, and uh, one of the things I love about about his performance in Yojimbo is the way how he's always scratching himself, and it really kind of drives home, like you said, that that mangy dog type of uh, mm-hmm. an- analogy. I didn't notice a whole lot of that going on in this movie. I think again, you know, there's the moment of transition for his character, because, like I said, mangy dog in Yojimbo, mm-hmm. and at the end of this movie. But he's more like a bi- a bear, yeah. Throughout this one, he's he's sleepier than he was in Yojimbo. He's always laying down, trying to take a nap, sleeping mm. much more than the scratching and the shoulder rolling. He's still doing a bit of, more of the shoulder rolling in this one, but it's not really until he is, you know, going for that final confrontation mm-hmm. when the when the Yojimbo theme starts up again. Then you see like his shoulders go back and his arms back in the thing, scratching himself. Sorry, audio listeners. <laughs> um, I, I I feel like that must have been on purpose. I think it had to have been, yeah, um, because it, it it does it speaks a lot more about his character. And I didn't really put those two things together until you were talking about um, the the difference. And it is a it's an interesting way that he does to to portray those differences and show that the character is not the same guy that he was in in Yojimbo and almost like um, and it's funny even though this is like you know less than a year after the first movie it is like revisiting this character at a much later point in life almost right it's kind of yeah. like you compare you know, Clint Eastwood in some of his early Westerns to Clint Eastwood in uh, Unforgiven, where he's, mm-hmm. you know, much more broken down, much more kind of like the the weight of all the killing is kind of, is hanging on him. And you get kind of that same sense of Sandra Doe in this movie as well. Yes. And just the, the idea in Yojimbo, it's almost a lark for him that he gets a little too invested in. Mm-hmm. And for this, he has no reason to stay and help them. And this this movie just starts. It just starts. And he has no reason to be like, you know what? 
I'll help you all out with this. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that surprised me. Just like that, I forgot about is just how quickly everything just the ball starts rolling. It's just because there it opens up on this scene with you know the samurai talking about this plot and everything, and then all of a sudden the door just opens and there's Sandro taking a nap. Yeah, it's and it's I, kind I, of funny I, that it was this adaptation because it does make you feel like. And maybe Kurosawa did this intentionally. It just kind of makes, does make you kind of feel that Sanjuro just kind of like wandered into the different movie set. Yes, it really does. And that's kind of like, you know, the, the classical hero narrative. Like there's mm -hmm. always the story about Hercules and the, the wagon wheel or whatever. That this guy gets his wagon wheel stuck and Hercules just happens to be passing by and pops the wagon wheel out of the ground and he's like, you can do better. Don't don't just wait around for someone to help you and then leaves. Mm -hmm. This is very much the same thing. You, they're having this problem and Sanjuro's just like, okay, you interrupted my nap, but I'm going to help you. Mm -hmm. And ostensibly, he's like, well, I haven't eaten for a few days, so maybe you feed me or whatever. But and also, I love that scene too when they the the samurai gives him like the whole bag of coins and he just reaches in, he takes out just a small bit. And he's like, oh, this is good enough. Yeah, I thought that was yeah. a. It's it's interesting too because you compare the because in both this movie and Yojimbo he does have kind of this older figure who's trying to kind of lecture him about you know the the dangers of the of his lifestyle. You've got the 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 old man in the in Yojimbo, and you've got the 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 Chamberlain's wife in this movie. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas you know he just kind of brushes off the old man every time in Yojimbo, and you know he's still. You know, he doesn't really care about the old man telling him that, you know, oh, you're killing too much and all that. He he just kind of brushes it all off. But in this one, the the Chamberlain's wife, her words really seem to resonate with him a lot stronger than than they did in Neo Jimbo. So I thought that was interesting too. Yes, everything gets not everything gets to him, everything she says gets mm -hmm. to him. Yeah. He's he's more capable of introspection. And I, I suspect I mean he's sleeping in a shrine, mm -hmm. you know. What what was he doing in the shrine to begin with? And then he says he was sleep. Part of the ruse, he says he was sleeping in the temple. Mm -hmm. there's, there's something that's, uh, I suspect, drawing the character there. Whether if that's just in the screenwriter's mind, story bible, or whatever, or something mm -hmm. Mifune was doing to color the character. There, there. He's already by the time we meet him in this movie on the path to introspection mm -hmm. after the events of Yojimbo or just his life. Cause we don't, there's no explicit drawing except the character between the two films. Right. There, and there's, yeah, there's no real, and even still, I was wondering too, as I was watching this, is this, um, could this be viewed as a sequel or could this be viewed as a prequel to Yojimbo? And, mm -hmm. and I think you could, and it depends on how pessimistic you want to go with the, the character's journey, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you could view it as him kind of accepting, you could view it, if you view it as a prequel, you could view it as him kind of accepting that idea of him being this unsheathed sword and just kind of like leaning into that, that mangy dog persona. Mm -hmm. um, or you could view it in a much more positive way in that, you know, this whole life has led him down this path of introspection and he's kind of forced to pick up the sword one last time and you know revert back to it and you can view it as a sequel in that way so i think it's a really interesting way that kurosawa constructs this movie because you could view it either way it depends on how you want to perceive the character's journey yeah and that's really interesting especially when you you bring back the the dollars trilogy into it mm -hmm. because those movies that each sequel is actually a prequel in terms of just the time they're set mm -hmm. And in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, you even have Clint Eastwood's character piecing together the iconic outfit throughout the movie mm -hmm. and getting like his, getting crushed throughout the movie, you know, going from trusting Tuco to Tuco betraying him to by the end of the movie, he doesn't trust anyone. Mm -hmm. And then he's the character we see in for a few dollars more who's 
more capable of doing good things than the character in A Fistful of Dollars. Mm -hmm. And then by the end, by A Fistful of Dollars, he's, you know, a cynical jerk. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a good point. I never realized that it they'd progressed in the opposite of their release. I, I gotta I gotta rewatch those movies again and, and look at it back from that from that perspective. Um, something too, I thought about you know the fact that the Chamberlain's wife's words resonate so strongly with him because she's not telling him you know if we go with the idea that the chronological order of these movies is the order they happen in the in the character's life. So if we look at Yojimbo as the first one and this is the second, like if you want to view it that way, you know, she's not telling him anything he hasn't heard before. Um, Mm -hmm. But still it, it strikes him so much more this time. And, and I think, and it reminds me of that scene in Yojimbo when he, he helps out the, the family and, you know, he helps rescue the wife and he gets very angry at the, at the husband and, and you kind of get the sense that he was once that boy, right? He was once that right. boy where that, that had happened to his mother. And um, bringing it back to uh, Fistful of Dollars, you know, Clint Eastwood almost makes it clear that that's what happened because he says to the family after he rescues them, you know, uh, I needed help once and there was nobody there to help me. Um, whereas in Yojimbo, he doesn't explicitly say that, but you kind of get the sense from right. how much angrier he gets in that scene compared to everything else and how much more of a personal interest he takes in that family's struggle that that's something similar had happened to his family. So I do think it maybe it makes a little bit more, it makes sense. And that kind of adds to that with the fact that it's, it's this older woman who maybe reminds him of his mother in some way. And that's Probably why the same age as his mother. Right. Yeah. Point. And that, or the, the age his mother would have been. Mm-hmm. And I think that, and I think that had, that's one of the reasons why that, her words hold so much weight for him compared to when it was the old man in Yojimbo. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the women in this movie, the two two main female characters, hold a lot of sway over the plot. They do a lot of mm-hmm. directing of how the story goes. Um, even in small ways that you think are kind of inessential. Mm-hmm. Like, Again, from the uh, the Chamberlain's wife telling him uh, that he he's reckless and an un- unsheathed sword or whatever, mm-hmm. and to her the the daughter, you know, making the decision like she has the opportunity to escape, and she hears him out and decides, no, I'll go back so they don't get suspicious and help mm-hmm. this plan long term. She doesn't have to do that, but nothing that follows would have been possible without that. Yeah, Kurosawa gives the women in both these movies a lot more agency than women tended to get in in these types of movies, even though they have relatively small parts. Because you all see that in Yojimbo, one of the gangsters, his wife is kind of the one who's calling the shots, right? Mm -hmm. And she's like berating her husband when he's not going far enough and he's not being, you know, strong enough. And you get the same kind of sense here with the Chamberlain's wife is like, she's kind of the brains of the operation. She knows everything. Yeah. She's the one who's kind of like in running the show here. Yes. And there's this casualness she has about it mm-hmm. that like when <laughs> my, my favorite part with her is probably when they're escaping and he offers to be her, her step mm-hmm. to get over the fence. And she goes, Oh no, that's rude. <laughs> like oh, okay but you have to get over somehow come on <laughs> and then of course you know she when he says wait for my signal and they say what's the signal gonna be he says uh wait till you see smoke coming from the house wait till it's burning mm-hmm. and if she hadn't interrupted and say no send the flowers down instead when he got captured, there was no way the signal could be sent. Mm-hmm. But because they changed it to get the flowers down, he's able to think on the spot and get his enemies to signal the ten, the nine to come help. That's a really good point. I, n- I hadn't even uh, picked up on that. But yeah, um, you know, and that's also kind of reflective of what she's, the lesson she's trying to impart on him because, you know, 
a smoke signal, obviously, that's a, a much more violent way to send a message, whereas dropping flowers down a stream, it's a much more subtle way of doing it. And she's trying to and she's a much and she's trying to express those things in a much more subtle way. Like she's trying to I think one of the messages that she's trying to convey to him is that you can solve your problems through ways that aren't just blunt force. Right. And it and it resonates with him throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. And he he grows a lot more yeah. in this than in Yojimbo. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think in Yojimbo. He doesn't grow in Yojimbo. Ex exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. He doesn't really grow at all in Yojimbo. He's pretty much, you know, he comes in, he's this, um, you know, he's this righteous, he's got, he's just kind of like, he comes in, rolls into town, kills a bunch of people, and then he kind of rolls out. But he, you don't get the sense that he's learned any sort of lesson in that movie whereas this one you definitely feel that there there's there's a lot more growth it's like it's like they took all the growth that he should have had in yojimbo and they just mixed it with the growth he's going to have in this movie so he has like two movies worth of growth in this one film <laughs> very much and i think that might be why i prefer this one uh, and again that is slight a slight mm -hmm. preference they're both i enjoy them both yeah um I think Yojimbo is probably the better film on a technical level, mm -hmm. but you know, just this one, seeing the character grow, change, have to revert for mm -hmm. a little bit, and then see that he has, even though he reverted to violence at the end, see that he has learned his lesson. Right. Um. I just think it's fascinating. And especially, I did not know that about that it was supposed to be an adaptation of something else. Yeah, yeah. I, it was, I, um, I think I had read about that before I'd actually seen that. So I'd known it going in. Um, and so every time I'm watching it, that, that, is always, that is always with me, kind of wondering, like, you know, how would this movie have gone if, you know, it hadn't been, if they hadn't tried to rewrite it and insert uh, Sandro into it? Right. And I... That makes so much sense. It just it because he's su such an outside force working on the story, mm -hmm. and then the story, especially in the form of the Chamberlain's wife, is working on him. It's something that you know the, these hero narratives that I was talking about earlier of the outside hero coming in, solving the problem, going away. The hero of those narratives rarely gets the opportunity to grow and change. Right. So the fact that they're able to pull that off in this is just kind of incredible. Mm -hmm. I really, I really like it. Yeah. Um, you're, you're kind of bringing me around a little bit on it. I still don't think it's, I still prefer Yojimbo, but, um, you're giving me a, a more of an appreciation for it after this conversation, because I am noticing a lot more the, I think what it is, another thing it is, is, um, not only the technical aspects, but also I think the side characters in Yojimbo with the exception of the Chamberlain's wife are a little bit more interesting to me. Oh yeah. As opposed to the, the, the young samurai here who are all just kind of like, you know, we could get rid of like half of them and I don't think the story would suffer no, at all. Not a, they're, they're like the seven dwarves. You don't, yeah, you don't yeah. need. Spe <laughs> Speaking of the, their scene uh, when they're first scouting uh, the house where they think the Chamberlain is being held and they're just following him without even thinking. Mm -hmm. And he's like, we can't move like a centipede. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're just, you, you, you need to remember two guys in it and you remember everyone you need. You, mm -hmm. the Chamberlain's nephew and the one who kind of looks like Don Knotts, mm -hmm. who's the, object, the objector. He's mm -hmm. always uh, saying, well, I don't like this guy. I don't like this idea. And once you have a handle on them, everyone else falls into the two camps. Yeah, yeah. And another thing that's interesting about them is just how much of a contrast they are to, to Sandro in that. And I think it kind of shows the limits of the, of the samurai system. And um, whereas Sandro is, you know, he's willing to do whatever's necessary. He's willing to, you know, take matters into his own hands. He's willing to try things that are unconventional. And as long as it gets the job done, whereas they're much more, they're, they're slaves to tradition. 
and they're yeah, slaves they're, to kind of like following orders and that sort of thing. They're constantly asking, um, thinking about the political implications mm -hmm. of how they respond to something. Right. And Sanjuro is thinking of, okay, what is our objective and how does this pan out in the long term? Right. Not so much for politics, but for everyone staying alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they're thinking, oh, well, who, you know, if, if we're all going to have to die for the Chamberlain's honor, then we're all going to have to die for the Chamberlain's honor because we are his, his samurai. Mm -hmm. Another thing, too, that I thought was interesting is the, the idea of appearances and the importance of appearances because they make that whole the the whole thing about the chamberlain he's you know he even says that you know you know my face has gotten me into a lot of trouble over the years because he's got this really long ugly face and this whole idea of well you know maybe the you know maybe the chamberlain is corrupt because he looks like he's corrupt mm -hmm. and that also is also similar to you think about yojimbo and the whole idea of him being you know, this kind of like ragged mangy dog. And in this one, he's wearing these rags and you see like the holes in his sandals and all that kind yeah. of stuff. And whereas he's the most honorable one in, in either movie. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a, a nice little commentary on Japanese society and the, the emphasis they put on the, the surface level as opposed to focusing more on the deeper level. Yes. And I, I, re I remember I had, had some friends from Japan who I, I was uh, camping with and we were, we were out there for like four days and the men were still shaving <laughs> every morning. <laughs> and I'm like, why are you, why are you shaving? We're not going to see anyone for <laughs> four days. They're like, well, only old men grow beards. <laughs> they told me. I'm like, oh, so like <laughs> okay so and just the 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 idea you know he's got these big sideburns and doesn't shave in between that and his mustache and he he doesn't shave the front of his head he mm -hmm. just pulls it back yeah you know, he's just not not the image right of the samurai and it's funny because even though uh, Muroto is set up as his his mirror. He is very proper. Mm -hmm. uh, he has the in, the new robes, the insignia of the of his master. Uh, he has his hair done properly. He carries both the the sword and the dagger. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's the most corrupt of them. Right, yeah. And he's proud of it too in that scene where they're they're having a drink together. Mm -hmm. Um he goes, "Hey, you know, we made it all up. The the superintendent's really the bad guy. And I work for him cuz I'm a bad guy too." Mm -hmm. Yeah, just completely embracing what he is. Um yeah. which is interesting because you have in, in Yojimbo where Sanjuro did embrace who he was and now he's kind of struggling with that. So even though who he who he is, even if it's you know someone who's outside of society, even if he is a killer, um, you know it's still an honorable. He's still a much more honorable man, but he still struggles with with those aspects of him. Whereas this other guy doesn't struggle with it at all. No, he enjoys it. Even it's mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, was there anything else you you want that kind of jumped out of you or that you wanted to talk about with uh, this film? I just really love it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I watch it fairly often. Uh, it's funny. I, I have the old Criterion DVD of it. Um, and I, I need to get the Blu-ray, the Yojimbo and Sanjuro double feature Blu-ray. But I, I just love this movie. And mm. uh, it's, it's one I come back to a lot. And I'm glad I could uh, you, have you take a second look at it. It's more Yeah, yeah, because I haven't, um, it never really stood out to me the first time I watched it, and probably just because it's Yojimbo's shadow looms so large over this movie. Um, and it does make me wonder how the movie would have fared if it wasn't, um, if it wasn't intended to be a, a sequel to, to Yojimbo. Um, 
I mean, I even still, it is, it does have a positive reception. Like it's got like hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes. So people mm-hmm. obviously do like it, but, um, but yeah, it is interesting that it's, despite that movie being so popular, this one doesn't seem to be as, as, uh, as well known. Yeah. And I, you know, that's part, that's part of why I champion it so much. Part of the reason I brought it up mm-hmm. when we were uh, discussing what film we were going to talk about. And I looked over your site, I saw you'd done your Jimbo already. I was like, well, we got to do Sanjuro. Yeah. Well, good for you. I did have them both. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, so that was great. That was, you definitely did make me uh, take another look at it. And definitely you're making me um, rethink my opinion uh, of this movie. And it's, uh, yeah, I'm probably gonna have to watch it again now to, to really kind of reabsorb everything after this conversation. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on, Robert. And uh, tell people where they can find uh, your podcast and your website or anything else you want to promote. So uh, Record All Monsters is the name of the show. If you Google it, it should come right up. But our website is recordallmonsterspod.wordpress.com. I can't afford to pay WordPress $100 a year to take that .wordpress off. So it's going to stay there. Uh, we're also on Instagram at recordallmonsters.pod on Twitter at Monsters Record and search Record All Monsters podcast on Facebook. We come right up. Um, On our website, we have links to all of that. We have our Tee Public store. Um, We just did a special mini episode on lost kaiju movies from outside of Japan where we covered uh, the 1962 Bulgasari that's lost, the Indian kaiju movie Gogola from 1966, and the one that the distributors are withholding that is available, but they won't distribute it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Space Monster Wang Magui. So uh, go take a listen to that. And if you get the Gogola song stuck in your head, we sell a t-shirt of it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, well, thanks for coming on. Uh, it was a really fun discussion. Uh, really good to, to, to talk about this movie and to, to have you come on the show. Thanks so much. I I really appreciate you having me on. I had a good time. Good, good. All right, uh, that does it for this episode of Japan on Film. As always, our website, japanonfilm.com, and we're at Twitter and Instagram, Japan on Film, at both of those. Uh, Please rate and review us, Apple Podcasts, um, you know, uh, like and subscribe on YouTube, and please spread the word. Tell your friends, and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Bye. Thanks for watching this episode of Japan on Film. For more of our videos, just hit the subscribe button. Thank you.